Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation, Chinese Experience in America, Kamwa Chung. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the community relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Our presenter is Don Merritt, museum curator for the Kamwa Chung State Heritage Site in John Day, Oregon. He has a master's degree in archaeology from the University of Montana and has worked for cultural resource management firms and state and federal agencies throughout the West, including the Utah State Parks. Don is now the steward for the most unique ch historic Chinese collection in North America at Kamwa Chung. Thank you so much, Don, for telling us about Kamwa Chung and how it paints a more realistic picture of Chinese experience in early Oregon. Well, thank you for having me, Laura. It's going to be fun to do. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, like Laurel said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Kamwa Chung today and kind of what we have learned about the Chinese community uh, through the experiences that we have discovered here at the site. Um, Kamwa Chung is a very unique site. It's actually listed as a uh, national um, historic landmark. And so it's very unique in the world. In fact, we have scholars and professors uh, come throughout the years. And back in 2018, we had some Chinese professors that practice uh, Chinese medicine. And they were here specifically to look at our collection. And one of them kind of quoted that one of the most significant sites in the world for telling the unique story of the Chinese abroad and the contributions they made during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And that doesn't even come close to what we actually have in the collections that we'll be getting to here in a moment. But uh, to start off with, I kind of like to go over a brief history timeline about how Kamwa Chung got here in the first place. So um, we're going to kind of start out in China because um, a lot of the Chinese immigrants that came to the United States was during the 19th century, um, even back before the 1830s, uh, Chinese started arriving here. And a lot of people kind of ask why were they um, leaving? And it's really because particularly in the Guangdong province, um, there was lots of poverty and famine. Uh, it was a very poor province and most of the Chinese there were just trying to find some way to live. So millions upon millions um, uh, died from poverty and famine and that many more uh, left uh, China to look for other places and opportunities around the world. And quite a few of them were coming in here into the United States. But some of them also left just to start a new life. And we actually have one of those people here at Kamachung by the name of Long An. He was one of those few. And so uh, this is a little immigration map because coming in the United States, most of the Chinese either came through San Francisco, um, Portland and Seattle. And then they would also go in through Vancouver to go in through Canada and come in from that direction there as well. Um, it was a little hard to see, but you can see kind of where the immigration maps were. And so when Gal uh, gold was discovered in California, a lot of Chinese were there and as the goal played out, they kind of moved from mining district to mining district, going from California through Nevada, finally up to Idaho and Montana. Well, we had a small group of Chinese that came through um, Canyon City, which is just south of John Day in the 1860s. And this map here shows the mining districts. And it's a little hard to see, but in the um, lower left, in the upper right um, of the map, you kind of see little red dots and little red numbers. Those are the, all the different mining districts. And so they kind of clustered together. And for us up here in John Day, we're right there. And that is where some Chinese on their way up to Idaho and Montana, Canton Canyon Creek, accidentally found gold and formed a Chinese town along with non-Chinese miners there as well. And they eventually formed the city of Canyon City and they formed a little Chinatown there. So that's when gold was discovered was in the 1862. And to start off with, they were just placed for miners and um, they were pretty well successful with that. And eventually it turned into hydraulic mining, certainly by the 1880s. And most of the workers on the hydraulic mines were Chinese laborers and miners. And so they worked quite extensively with that. Um, a lot of people question um, 
who built Kim Wa Chong, and a lot of people think it was the Chinese. So in the picture in the lower left, you can see the Kim Wa Chong building as it was in the 1870s. And it was actually built by the Dolls Military Road Company as part of their effort to connect the road from Canyon City to the Dolls. And so they built this building for, as a supply depot and a trading post stage stop. And it wasn't until 1872 that the Chinese laborers actually bought it, turned it into a general store, and named it Camo Chung and Company. So that's how the building itself got here. In 1885, a couple of things happened that year. First off, the Chinatown that was in Canyon City mysteriously burnt down, as represented by a similar picture there at the bottom. And the Chinese were not allowed to rebuild there. Instead, they were forced to come over to um, the John Day area, which is downstream, and kind of build and live in the swampy delta area of Canyon Creek and the John Day River confluence. So a lot of Chinese moved there. And when they did, that made it the third largest Chinatown in the US, only after San Francisco and then Seattle or Portland, depending on what year you look at. Also during that same year, that is when two Chinese gentlemen by the name of Lung An and Ying Da Ke um, actually first met. Uh, they decided to go into business together and partner up. So they bought Kim Wan Chung Company in about 1887 and then lived and ran the businesses out of there for the next 60 years up and through the 1940s. By 1910, most of the Chinese population had left. And um, the Chinese that were here were ranchers, miners, and laborers. And most of them went back to China or even back to Portland at that point. And by the 1930s, most of the Chinese population was pretty much gone. Um, there was about 20 individuals that were still living here at that time. Here on the left-hand side is Ying Dot K. And then on the left is Lung An. He was the businessman of the two. And we'll be talking a little bit more about them a little bit later on. And the photograph on the bottom shows what Chinatown looked like um, sometime after 1903, which is just on the north west side of John Day, which you can see the buildings of downtown right there. Where that big building is on the left, that is the old middle school, and that is where our interpretive center is right now today. In the 1930s, after the Chinese left, there was not much left of Chinatown either. Um, in the 1930s, um, there was a dredging operation that took place on the John Day River. You can see, kind of see up on the upper photograph uh, a lot of the tailing piles from all the dredging that they did, similar to the Sumter Valley area where the dredge is still currently up there. But that little dot you see at the end of the arrow, that's Kim Chung, and that's all that remained of Chinatown. Because in the black and white photo below, that's what it looked like in the 1950s. So they leveled out the area and put in all the housing development. And so there's not much left of Chinatown that still remained even at that time. In 1940, uh, Lungan passed away and he left his entire state to Dot K. And in 1948, Dot K fell, broke his hip, had to be taken, important to be mended. He thought he'd be back in a couple weeks. So he just locked the doors, locked the windows, and never came back. So the building has been locked from 1948 up until about 1968, when the city was going to develop the area and turn that into a park. Sometime in 1952, um, Ng Hay, Dot K, um, he actually passed away in Portland, and he passed away um, from heart failure. And when he passed away, he put in his will, he wished to leave everything to his daughter, who was still living in China at the time. However, they could not locate her. And so eventually the estate went to his nephew, Bob Hua. And he took ownership of Camel Chung and he ran it through the 1950s. And in about 1955, he put a little stipulation as well that if anything should happen to him, he wanted the Kemo Chung building saved as a museum uh, for as testament for the Chinese immigrants into the United States. 
And so uh, when he passed away in 1966, the Camel Trump building was supposed to go to the city of John Day and they were gonna turn it into a museum. However, um, in 1968, when the city was gonna develop the area into a park and tear the building down, uh, they kind of think they kind of forgot about that little stipulation because one of the city council members by the name of Gordon Glass, who was on the historical society at the time, decided, well, maybe we should see what's inside the building first before we tear it down. So they opened up the doors, saw what they saw, came back, said, we're going to make a museum. And we'll get into a little bit more about that here shortly. So the building actually was saved and turned into a museum, even though that really was not their intent because they actually forgot about that uh, will stipulation. So in the 1970s, there was a round of renovations to restore the building. And the photograph on the bottom right is what it looked like in the 1970s as through the renovations. The other photo, the black and white one was um, shortly before that. You can kind of see there was a little bit of difference and they actually added on the historic porch that was there in the 1920s. In 2005, uh, the city um, ran, ran it as a museum from 1976 until 2005. And at that point, the city just could not afford to do that any longer. So they came to state parks, wanting to know if we would take it over, which we was very happy to do so. And so we started running it as a museum, as a state park in 2006 and 2007. And we have been running it, doing tours ever since then. So this is what they found when they opened up the doors in the 1968. Everything is still in its place, pretty much as it was since 1948 when that cave left. Uh, when the sea uh, opened up the doors, it was dark. Uh, there was no power, obviously and they just use flashlights. And the only thing that these photos don't show is that when they first opened up, it was filled with other boxes and crates and other items in there where you could barely walk through. So they removed all those materials just so they can open up for tours so people can go through the building. But other than that, everything you see is still in its place since 1948 when Dot K left. So top left, you can see the view of the main room with a little red table and a little stove. Looking back behind the wall is the uh, general store that Long On ran. The right hand photographs kind of shows the bear paw with a lot of the Chinese medicine bottles. And in the background that you can still see the tins and boxes and bags of all the different herbs that Dot K used that are still there, still in place. And we have yet to identify um, most of them. We identified about half. We still got halfway to go. Bottom um, left hand photo shows the general store and it is stocked with a variety of different items there as well. And everything in that room is there since 1940. Because after Long On passed away, Doc K did not actually do any business um, through the store. So all the items are still in place since that point. The little lanterns, little paper lanterns that you see hanging from the ceiling, um, they are all there since 1915, is the latest ones. And in the back wall, you can still see the shrine where they would uh, practice Taoism and also do offerings to have a prosperous year and other uh, different ceremonies such as that. And here you see uh, Dot K's bedroom up in the top left. And take special note of that little trunk underneath his bed. We'll be talking a little bit about that later on and what was found inside that. But as you can see, it's partially decorated, uh, decorated, not a lot going on in there. Then if you move into another room, which would be the kitchen area, you can see, you'll see where all their pots and pans and items on the shelves are, the little table. And they use that big stove up there in the right-hand corner for all their cooking. You can still see the very large wok that's there on the stove that they use to uh, provide meals to all the Chinese immigrants when they would come through. And we'll talk a little bit later. On the opposite end of that room was the bunk area. When the Chinese community was here, uh, Langan would um, provide lodging to the Chinese immigrants when they first came into town. And he would charge them five cents a night per person four people per bed. 
Yes, you heard me right. Four people per bed. So he would have probably upwards of 16 people kind of um, from head to toe um, laying across those beds uh, during his time. Then after the Chinese left, uh, Long An would use, or Dot K would actually use it for his patients. Um, by the 1900s, he was very well known as a medical doctor. And so people would come as far away as Texas and South Dakota to be treated by him. And so he would provide them a place to stay and recuperate if need be. Also what was found in the buildings, which is unique, um, not only in North America, but in the world. And these are what the professors and scholars were really talking about. In the building, uh, we discovered 20,000 documents um, in our collection. And most of it is still written in Cantonese Chinese, which that's the style of writing that you see there. And these documents include everything from commercial flyers, advertisements, um, letters, business letters, personal letters, and dot case formulas. Uh, of the 20,000 documents, about 5,000 of them are related to medical um, topics. And of those, about three to 4,000 are Dot K's medical formulas that he hand wrote, like the one that's right there at the top. And he would write all this information down. And because of that, we have one of the few remaining in the world about how Chinese doctors treated their patients. Uh, prior to the Communist Party taking over in 1949. Because during that time, um, there was a quite the uprising that the government there did not want anything of the past Chinese to last. So a lot of the documents, books, and research was either destroyed or lost. So we're one of only three places in the world that still has historic documentation such as this. In, a lot of the researchers and professionals saying we're probably definitely in the top three, probably number two in the world for the kind of documents that we have. So it's a very important collection that we have here on site. And we, and like I said, with all these documents, maybe only 12% of that has been translated. So we have not gotten very far into it. In fact, of the 4,000 or so uh, formulas, we only got about 10% of those translated. And a lot of that has to do with Oakham, the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine, and which you can actually go online if you look them up and you can go to the Kemal Chung link and you can actually see their translations of these medical formulas. And one of the unique things about this is that in 1918, Dake actually wrote out a formula to treat the influenza flu outbreak during that time, which you may have heard about in, in recent weeks, recent months with our current pandemic. So there actually, um, a professor wrote out an article uh, just a few weeks ago saying how this formula that Dot K did back then is very likely a treatment that could have been used for the COVID pandemic here today. So if that's the case, that's pretty huge. And who knows what else could be in all these documents that we are not aware of yet at this point. So who was Dot K? Well, he was born in 1862 and died in 50, 1952. He was 89 years old at the time. And like we said, he broke his hip in 1948. A lot of people kind of were wondering about where his knowledge came from. Did he learn it here in the United States or did, was it brought from China? Well, with the professors that we talked to a few years ago, they're, they're pretty convinced that he did get his training in China and he learned um, herbology and pulsology. If you've never heard of pulsology before, it's just the practice of where um, they are trained to fuel your pulse. And with a few questions, they can actually diagnose what is wrong with you by feeling your pulse. And Dot K was very gifted at that. And there's lots of stories about um, his treatments and how he was able to do that, including predicting instead of having one child, when a woman came in um, who was feeling ill, found out she was pregnant by Dot K, and, she, and he said, well, you're gonna have twins. And eight months later, she had twins. Just one of the many stories that we have. 
of him doing that kind of work. He was also partially blind. In 1888, there is accounts that he was uh, somewhat blind, uh, had a hard time seeing. And by 1940, he was almost completely blind. And so with all of his accomplishments, he was also pretty blind at the time doing all this work here as well. He was also very well known throughout the medical community, particularly in the Chinese medical community. We have several letters from other doctors across the nation, primarily from San Francisco and Portland area. And they would confer with Dr. K on a number of um, ailments and he would provide what his knowledge is and how to treat those. And so he was thought out, thought, um, out um, in the Chinese community, particularly for that. But he was also a business partner for long on. And so he was also into other things here as well besides medicine, but that is what he was well mo more known for. These $23,000 of bond cash checks, these is what was found in Doc Case trunk underneath his bed, if you refer to that. When they first opened up the buildings and opened up the trunk, they found these $23,000 worth of bond cash checks, mostly dating from the 19 late 1920s and early 1930s, which if you recall, that's kind of the start of the Great Depression. A lot of people kind of question why he didn't cash these checks and a lot of theories with that. However, um, someone that knew Doc K um, was interviewed and they asked him about that. And he says, well, I asked him about that once. And what he told me, he says, I don't need the money, they do. And so that was just one of the examples of his generous nature, because at the time he didn't need the money. And so he just never cast checks. And now if you're curious, that means that that's about $350,000 in today's money that never got cashed. And like I said earlier, he had many stories. Uh, he had many stories of his generous um, deeds, his kindness, and certainly about his gifted profession in doing pulsology and doctoring. And um, I can go on hours and hours just telling you different stories about Doc Kane, what he did. Um, but the point is he was very kind and he would give kids uh, pieces of candy, like candy kisses. And he would also do that with any of the women folk that he happened to walk by down the street as well. And there's a lot more to Doc K than what was previously thought. Um, of these 20,000 documents that we have, we got most of them scanned and archived now that we're starting to get translated. And we're finding that Dot K was involved in a lot more than just doing his medical practice. He also um, dabbled a little bit in the stock market and doing other businesses as well. And he was pretty smart. Um, the only reason he doesn't get a lot of credit for that is because he could not. Uh, write in English, and he could barely speak English. And that's a, part of the only reason why he really wasn't more known for his business practices, because he just never really got into it too much because of that. Unlike Long On. And I can say he was passed away in 1940 at the age of 78. He what would we consider the China boss. He was a liaison between the Chinese and non-Chinese. He would help the Chinese workers when they uh, first come in, find work, lodging, provide meals. Um, he would write letters home for them. He would help tell their fortunes. And he was involved with anything and, and everything um, when the Chinese immigrants first arrived into town. And he had a status in the Chinese community for doing that. But he was also a natural businessman. If there was a way to make money off of something, he did it. Um, he would charge for all these services that he did. And he also owned a variety of property throughout the state of Oregon and Washington, including mining claims, rental properties. And he was co-owner for several other businesses here as well. And he's also an astute gambler. Um, he made many fortunes gambling and lost many fortunes gambling and he owned resources, and he would name the resources after the previous owner. And because of his gambling, he and Langan did 
did not always get along very well. And I'll tell you a little story about that later on. And like I said, he was always looking for money. And one of the ways he did that was through a car dealership. In fact, we found out that he was the first Chinese American in the United States to own a car dealership called the Tourist Garage. And again, there's many, many stories I can tell all about that, but he was very prevalent in, in that uh, in that realm. In fact, he would actually um, get a ride to Portland himself and drive the brand new car back to town here. And he also would hire teenagers as young as 14 to drive vehicles back uh, to John Day as well. He invested in the stock market. He had um, accounts in at least six different banks. And one of the banks is the uh, US Bank in Portland. And there's a little side story with that I'd like to share because it kind of goes in with how the Chinese were perceived. And on the wall in the back bunk area, there is a plaque with a certificate. And that certificate was basically thanking um, Doc K for his loyal service with the bank. Well, we always assumed it was because of the amount of business that we, he was doing with it. However, about three years ago, Scanning the last of the documents, I came across the letter from that bank president. In that letter, he stated, Wang Ang, I wish to thank you for loaning us the money to keep the bank open. To me, that was a very powerful statement. Because who in today's world, any private citizen loaning bank money, much less a Chinese immigrant who is not even a citizen? That goes to show you what, how well he was. Uh, um, viewed in the community and how wealthy he was to loan a bank money to keep it open. And a couple of years ago um, on one of the tours, we actually had a former bank president that corroborated that story because he actually remembers seeing the documents in their bank vault with the Long Island signature loaning that money. Uh, we do not know how much he loaned and we do not know if he even got paid back. But that just, I think, is a keystone uh, story in how these two gentlemen, particularly along on, um, played a part in the community and how the stereotype of the Chinese really doesn't fit all the time, particularly with the, the people here in John Day, which made him a pillar of the community because he was so generous. Even though he made money, he was still generous and he was very well liked. And he did a lot of things for the community, including loaning money to other businesses. And, and I think there was even an instance where he loaned a little bit of money to open up to the school here in town here as well. And with all those businesses that he was involved in, it's likely that he and Doc K were probably in the top four richest men in the county. And they were very well off, and, but you would never know it because they spent all their time um, living in the little building of Kamala Chung. They never pursued another um, place of residency at all. So what do we know about Wang An and Dot K? They were not your typical Chinese of the era. Um, a lot of uh, talk of the Chinese is, was how stupid they were and how much trouble they caused. And in our case, that just simply wasn't the case. Was there a lot of violence to the Chinese? Yes, there were. Even here in town, there were some instances. But in general, likely with the influence of Long An and Dot K, the um, prejudices were not as prevalent here. And so they were able to make a home for themselves here in John Day and be respected by the local community. Um, there's a couple instances where Long An and Dot K were arrested for possession and selling of opium at the time. But opium at the time they were arrested was still legal. It was mainly the county sheriff did not like Chinese. And so he did everything he can to disrupt their lives. Um, but the community was behind them. So much in fact that when Dot K was arrested three times for practicing medicine without a license, um, he was acquitted. And a couple of times the judge just threw out the case. And he told the prosecutor, he says, don't bring this man back into my courtroom again. He is our town doctor, leave him alone. And since then, they would been very well respected here in town. Um, and Dake was the key to acceptance. 
um, because of his medical knowledge, most of his patients were non-Chinese. Because after the Chinese left, other patients started coming to them because at the time, the medical pers uh, doctors in this area really weren't that well versed. And so when people were going to the doctors and they couldn't get results, they would, as a last ditch effort, go to see Doc K. Well, he would come out with his ingredients, uh, mainly broths and ointments, and he was very successful with that. Even though it smelled bad and tasted even worse, most of the patients recovered from whatever ailment they had. It may not have been quick, but they did eventually cover. And the, we have numerous um, audio histories about patients of Doc K and how well that he did do his practice. But it was Lung An who was the mover. Through his businesses and entrepreneurship and his ability to speak and write English fluently, it allowed him to work with Doc K as a compliment. And the, between the two of them together, that is what we think helped make Grant County what it is today. They formed the groundwork uh, with very little, with very little problems, really, and they helped the Chinese community not only in John Day, but throughout the region. Um, we think Camel Chong was really the central cultural point between Boise and Portland. So Camel Chong, through Long Island Dot K, was the center of all the Chinese um, going on in here, and they really helped make Chinese a lot better, more than what the other places in the country have. So with some closing thoughts, um, so what have we learned? Well, we learned that the documents that we have yet to translate probably hold a treasure trove of information. We also know that the little bit of documentation that we have and some oral histories from local town residents about Da Tain Long An is that um, the Chinese who here, not just Long Island Dot K, but most of the Chinese were treated very well. And it kind of goes against what you would think of the Chinese in the late 19th century and early 20th century, because they were doing all this businesses, owning property, they were even allowed to vote. And this was not allowed through the 1888 Chinese Exclusion Act. The Exclusion Act that was passed was mainly a series of laws by the federal government and it had a lot of restrictions on the Chinese and different communities and states took various measures uh, to address that, some very violently, other ones uh, were harder enforced. But because of these restrictions, only certain kinds of Chinese were allowed into the country, including merchants and doctors, which Long An and Dai Ke were part of that. And so we have learned through that uh, that this group of Chinese, particularly Long An and Dai Ke, found a way to get around those exclusion acts. And that is where I think having the support of the community really helped because they were not subject to a lot of the persecutions of other Chinese in that area. Because they did a lot for this, um, for this area and for the state. And once we get some of these documents translated, I think we'll have a lot better picture exactly, either indirectly or directly, how they influenced a lot of what Oregon did here because they were not near as violent as some other states. And we're going to learn a lot more about Dot K's medical formulas through the medical practice. Uh, we have researchers currently working on translating more of it and doing research in the different ingredients that are really, some of them are no longer found in the world. Uh, some of the plant species that we have in our collection are now extinct. And so we have some of the original forms that are no longer found anywhere else. And what we can learn about the other Chinese community um, is going to be fantastic because not only do we have the documentation here and the items, but we're also doing a little bit of archaeology. And last couple of years, we've had um, archaeologists come through through the um, Sula, the Southern Oregon University with uh, Chelsea Rose leading the project, the Chinese Dysphoria Project of Oregon. And with her help, we're learning a lot more about the Chinese and they are doing field schools here and um, Passport and Time projects doing archeology. span And we have found several building structures in this area. And eventually we're gonna be uh, getting the city park where most of the Chinatown is. And so eventually, hopefully within the next year or so, 
is that we will have pretty much all that remains of Chinatown, which is still underneath the ground. So once we get that, we'll have a lot better understanding of how this community uh, worked in the greater scheme of state and, uh, and of the nation and world really with everything else that we're learning. So this is just the beginning. I mean, we've been doing this research and trying to translate the documents since 2007, and even a little before. And we're just at the tip of the iceberg. We have much more to do uh, with more translations, more projects. And to help with all this, we do do tours of Kenwa Chung. And last year we were kind of closed down because of COVID. And this year we still are not allowed to do tours inside the building because it's small. But we are going to be doing something a little different this year. And we are going to be doing tours virtually. In fact, we hired a company and they are in the process right now of getting it set up. But uh, you can go to any of our websites and um, as you do a virtual tour and you can now come out here to Ken Chung start in May and do a virtual tour here that we are actually going to give with tour guides. And it's going to be to the point to where you can actually use your VR goggles or phone, computer, anything and actually look inside the building. It's I took a preview this morning and it's going to look fantastic. Um, but that's kind of where we're going with this because we're also in the plans of adding a new interpreter center here that we are starting the plans of. In a few years, we'll have a brand new interpreter center with a VR viewing room, uh, a larger exhibit area. And I hope to also include the footprints of all the Chinatown buildings. And so we'll do a lot more interpretation and learn a lot more of that direction. And so a uh, lot to look forward and the websites where you can go and view all this. If you just Google it, um, look through a search engine, look up friendsofcamelchung.com. You'll see links to our virtual reality tours and a lot more information that way. And all through through oregonstateparks.gov. You can uh, look up information there and we'll have links there as well. And so with that, that concludes my little presentation for today. Thank you, Don. Uh, this is, we have such a gem here in our state. That's amazing. Um, I just had a couple questions sure. uh, because I know that you just scratched the, the tip of the iceberg here of, <laughs> of all the information about these two men. I'm really struck by how, you know, they're, um, how they're smart, they're rich, they're pillars of the community, they're kind, they're generous, they're very successful, uh, both Da Ke and Lung An. And that is not the story that we're often told about early Chinese Americans. It's um, not. And um, over the last few years, we're getting a lot more um, uh, into exactly what did the Chinese do for our country? And we're just starting to learn about that, how much influence they really did have. I mean, it wasn't all that long ago for the Transcontinental Railroad that they didn't even admit there was Chinese workers there. It was never in their photographs. And now over the last couple of years, uh, my brother Chris Merritt, who is the State Historic Preservation Officer in Utah, um, he's working with the BLM and other entities over there. And they are really now getting that part of the story more in tune because there was 25,000 Chinese workers there that built that railroad and you hardly ever hear anything about that. Not much less with all the mining that they did and the actual physical labor. A lot of the stuff that we have in the country in the West that we have would not be here if it wasn't for Chinese physical labor workers and they were treated horribly, most of them. But the stories like through Kemal Chong we're finding it's like, well, it's not typical of all of them. And we're finding that they were actually, um, they did a lot more for us than what we give them credit for. And we're right. just going to find a lot more of that as we go through. Mm. And, and I am struck, you know, uh, you said a lot of the Chinese left Eastern Oregon by 1910 to 1930s. Is that, do we know why? Is it because of the 1888 Chinese exclusion laws? That's part of it. Um, because even if it, it because there was a, a state law that Chinese could not take residency or could not even marry um, non-Chinese people. And that law was finally changed in the 1960s. And so there were still laws preventing a lot of them what they could do. 
I mean, after um, it was 1943 that they actually rescinded the Chinese Exclusion Act. That's because Chinese, China was an ally of the United States during World War II. And that was one of the conditions of China, like, we'll be your ally, but you got to get rid of the law. Mm. And so that is how that kind of came about. So the law was still in effect for a long time. And Oregon um, finally was able to change their laws in the 1960s. And so because of all these laws and restrictions, um, they really didn't get a foothold into here as citizens. And so a lot of them did go back home because primarily when they left China, that was the reason. They wanted to make money and either send it back or take it back home. And that's one of the things we also found with Long Island and Doc Hay is that they did not because they were both married, they both had children, but they never saw their families after 1885. Wow. And they had the opportunity to bring their families here to the United States and live with them. They just, for some reason, chose not to do so. Hmm. They thought John Day was their home. This is where they wanted to stay, and they made their lives here. Hmm. And they sent very little money back to their families. We have letters um, from both Dot K and Langan's folks saying, we miss you. We want you to return home. Can you send us money? We're starving. And they would send very little money back because they were investing that money here in the States and also the trying to change the government at the time. So they were donating a lot of their money to for government reform in China. Well, and but they're yeah. so kind and generous here in the in Eastern Oregon, in their community here. Yeah. And that that also is not a story that's that's told uh, because it could be seen that they're being cruel to not send the money to their family. But Chinese Americans are not given credit for what they invested in the Correct. communities that they're in. Yeah, because they were actually enculturated here. They, they, they took up a lot of the uh, practices of the American society, but they kept a lot of the Chinese, like their religion and how they treated families and, and not for their own families, but for other Chinese families. They made sure that they got um, money to send their families back home if they passed away or uh, sending letters. So they did a lot for their Chinese community, just not for themselves, other than that they made money for themselves. And so they were very satisfied here. And they mm -hmm. really helped a lot of the Chinese get back home. And so that's part of the reason why they left here also is because not only because of that, because all the labor jobs from ranching, railroad, and mining were pretty much gone. So they just, the Chinese just kind of filtered away. But the Chinese community that did live here worked on ranches, worked in stores, and we have other information about other Chinese, not a lot, but a few, um, that made their lives still here in Chinatown, even after it was pretty much gone. Yeah, I wonder how unique it is that they, that Kama Chung both served as a, you know, a hub for the Chinese American community and also, you know, the white community once the uh, Chinatown was mostly gone. Well, you just you, you don't hear about that very much, and um, and with through Kemo Chong, we're such a small site, and it's a state park, so it's not really told nationally. Where the word is fine getting out, um, but there's very few um, places, maybe five or six, I think, up in the country that are even equivalent to just the aspect of Kemo Chong working with the Chinese and non-Chinese to help develop the community. There's very few examples of it, and it, that story is just not being told until recently. There's a lot more awareness going on now and, and we're going to be a part of that. We're, we're making connections with everyone else and, and we're just a unique site, but we also can kind of help tell the broader story of what's going on. Well, thank you so much, Don. This is fascinating and I know that a lot of people in the audience will probably want to you know, visit and at least they have this option to visit virtually in the meantime, um, but they can visit later on and as well. Can. All right, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, and I just wanna say thank you in the audience for joining us virtually. We have many wonderful programs that you can check out that are all uh, fun, free and virtual. Please visit our event guide to shootslibrary.org forward slash calendar or go to our YouTube channel to see recordings of mini presentations. Thank you everyone and until next time.